Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihao, Kenichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Kate D. Carmelo. She is the author of Because of Win Dixie, and she's here to talk about her brand new book, Beverly, right here. Before we invite Kate in, I want to let you know that this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Pilates for Parenting by our friend Holly Kenley. Pilates for Parenting. I think this is a brilliant concept. I mean, we're all very much aware of how important it is for us to exercise, to keep our bodies fit and healthy. We join gyms, we take classes, we develop daily disciplines all in an effort to better care for ourselves. So why don't we take the same approach to our most important role, parenting? This powerful little book points out that from the moment your child enters the world, you are the most important person in your child's life. Pilates for Parenting teaches simple yet powerful exercises that will help you strengthen your parental core. Implementing the exercise will help you develop daily disciplines to become more aware and mindful of your role as a parent. And let's face it, that is the role that is most important to us. Pilates for Parenting by Holly Kinley is a must-have resource for all parents and guardians. Get it today on Amazon. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Little Pearls Reflections by our friend Sarah Ann Kinnear. What a beautiful series. This is a great series for your third, fourth, fifth, sixth grader. If your kids love puzzles, if they love mysteries, they're going to love Little Pearl's Reflection. Now, Sarah Ann Kinnear, she has been a teacher and a principal for over 35 years. And she's worked in classrooms and behind the scenes educating kids and creating innovative curriculum that encourages independent thought and creative problem solving. That's why she created Little Pearl's Reflection, to, to inspire kids to think creatively and, 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 and to get use your imaginations to solve mystery. It really is a fun series. A fun series that you will love reading with your kids. Check it out today. Little Pearl's Reflections by Sarah Ann Kinnear. Available on Amazon. Joining us on the line right now from sunny and warm Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is a two-time Newbery medalist and the author of a book that you all might have heard of uh, because of when Dixie. Please welcome to the show, Kate DiCamello. Kate, how are you? I am very well and very glad to be talking to you. And it is sunny here. It, it's, I, it, yeah, it's a little cold in Minneapolis, <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. But it is very sunny, yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's great. We're really excited to have you on, and we're really excited to learn about your latest book, Beverly, right here. Can you uh, tell us about it? I can. So Beverly is uh, one of a trio of girls, and this all started for me with a book called Rainy Nightingale, uh, where Rainy Clark becomes friends with Louisiana Elefante and Beverly Topensky. So I wrote that book, and then... Um, Louisiana Elefante wanted her own book, so that was Louisiana's Way Home. And then I thought, Beverly needs a book, too. Mm. So that is this book, Beverly, right here. And in uh, the first book, the girls are 10. And in uh, the second book, there are 12. And now Beverly is 14 and has run away from home. That is, it, it's such a... a a really trying and, and difficult time, especially in girls' lives, that, that transition into the teenage years, it can be so tumultuous. Yes, yes. And I think that, you know, I, I think that not only, I mean, you anticipate it as a child and then as an adult, you remember it for the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you know. So it is a very critical time in your life. And it's a very critical time to um, run away from home. You know, 14 is like, you know, she's, she's not an adult. She's still a child and, um, terrible things could happen, mm-hmm. but instead, 
uh, wonderful things happen. She is welcomed and again and again by people who love and see her. It, it is a really, really dangerous time because, as, as you say, the, a 14-year-old is, is not an adult, but they're, you know, they're, they're looked on as adults by, by people who are looking to prey on, on young women. And um, I'm really happy that Beverly does not experience that. No, she is, she is very, very lucky in how, um, she, but she, I was, gonna, she is lucky, but she also has an instinct for who she can trust and who she can't. And so she's, this book is so much about her. Um, she's very, she can be very loving and she can be very tender hearted, but the book is about her. Her learning to let herself be loved, I think, and she chooses wisely um, uh, with who who to let in. There are a lot of, well, I was going to say, there are a lot of kids, there are a lot of teenagers out there who have a hard time letting people love them. There's a lot of adults that have a hard time letting people love sure. them. Sure, it's the, it's the lifetime project, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so to learn to let yourself be loved. Wait, wait, there's what's the uh, William Blake quote? We're we're here to learn to endure the beams of love. Yeah, so it's not just kids who struggle with this; it's all of us. Do you, obviously, you know, be, being hurt when you're younger, I, I imagine, causes a lot of that. But it, are, are there other things that, that that you think cause us to kind of? Of, of put up our, our defenses and, and, and prevent people from loving us? I think that, um, I think that once you love and are loved in return, uh, the world becomes much larger, but you also realize at the same time that, um, you'll never be, you'll never be safe once, once that happens. So I think it's fear. That makes us afraid of, of loving that way and being loved that way because you can't, you can't make yourself or the people that you love safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have theories? I don't know if I have a theory, but there is one quote that, that I've, I've heard over the years and I can't remember who said it, but it, 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 it really kind of spoke to me is that, Every relationship that we have is going to end in sorrow, whether the person passes away or whether we, we break up, whether we move on, even even relationships that kind of end amicably and, and we're still friends. We, we, we lost that, that kind of fire, that passion, and, and there's some sorrow in, in that loss. Right, right. You know, I, and I think that's so true. It's, it's, and since you're sitting there with a dog and, and I'm hiding from the dog, um, I, it makes me think of, um, uh, I, because I, this is my, the second dog of my adult life. And you, after you go through the death of a dog, you think, man, I will never ever do that again. It's too terrible. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that, um, life is meaningless unless you like love. So in between all that sorrow is here's the point I'm getting to in between all the sorrow is this almost unbearable, wonderful joy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, um, that's the price of admission is the sorrow. But in return, you get all the joy of loving and being loved. That's that. I think that's, that's a lesson that's so hard for some people to, to learn and accept. Well, as you know, I, I think, I think it's something that we all wrestle with to one degree or another for, for all of our time here because we want to control things mm. and we want to make things safe. And, um, and it's like you can't, we can't do it. Mm-hmm. And, and the only, the only, the biggest way to make yourself safe is, uh, is, you know, counterintuitively to throw yourself out there and, and love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you, as you're saying that, we're not able to control things. I, I, I remember the conversation we had before we started um, recording about me trying to control my travel schedule and, and <laughs> right. throwing out outrageous quotes when I didn't want to go somewhere. And then you end up going. <laughs> and I end up right? going. That's right. <laughs> and then no one's there, and then it's and then it's a standing room only. I know. It's, so it's just yeah, no, it's a, it is that thing of like we want to. If, and, and I think about this a lot because of traveling all the time. And I think, oh, ah, geez, I don't want to do that. And then invariably, and I've learned to do this emotional math for myself before I go. When I come home, I'm so grateful for all the experiences that I had. And I think, man, what if I hadn't done that? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, you know, I've learned to like push past that small shriveled part of myself that wants to say no 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 and i just I, i've learned to say yes and and that i think is a lot of what um this book about beverly is about is her learning to say yes yeah yeah one of the things that, that my daughter and and who has traveled uh with me a, a whole lot when she when she was younger in fact was on that tour we Mentioned earlier when, when I was in, uh, deepest, deepest, muggiest Alabama in the middle of August is that one of the joys in life is, is learning how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. There's a great quote from, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I can't, you can look it up after, after we finish talking, but it's like, it, it, you know, we always, we want to be comfortable, but as soon as we're comfortable, then all hope of growth is gone. Mm. So it's just like, we're always after that comfort, but if there's any hope at all for us, it's in being uncomfortable all the time. And that's where all the joy is too. It's so strange, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you think, Oh, I'll be happier if I'm not, if I'm comfortable, but the joy is in, in the discomfort and what, what you learn yeah. from it. Yeah, and those stories that you get to share for the rest of your life uh, f from being uncomfortable. Right, 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 right. It changes you, and it opens you up. Now, you've spent many years writing about and thinking about and exploring these these tweens and teens. What was it about this these characters and age group that, that br drew you to them? It, yeah, it, I don't know that it was... Well, one, let's just say this, it was not intentional. I wrote Ramey Nightingale and I've never, you know, from the, from the time I started in the first book that I wrote was because of Winn-Dixie and probably within like eight weeks of that being published, I started to hear from kids about, you know, wanting a sequel. And I, it's like, nope, I know I left Opal in a safe place and, and she's happy and it's good. I'm not going to go back in there. And so I, I've never, thought I've never done a sequel before. And this, these aren't even sequels. It's kind of like a loose trilogy, but I've never gone back in to a character in a novel and, and revisited. And uh, these characters were just so strong uh, and haunted me so much. And that I did it kind of unwittingly. I did not intend to go back in there, but I guess, I guess the short answer is I'm haunted by these girls. Mm -hmm. That's the short answer. Yeah. Well, it, it, in reality, a, a 10 year old girl is a lot different than that same person when she's 14. Right. That's right. Very yeah. different. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I have a very strong, beautiful and intelligent 15 year old young woman in my life right now. And she's amazing. And, but it does, it, it it's, you know, listening to her talk is it's fun and it's also uh, baffling sometimes, and it's also terrifying because of you know how differently she sees the world. Right, and and also because you can't, given back to that safety thing, you can't make her safe in the world. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, yeah. What kind of conversations do you think families can have? Because the Reading With Your Kids podcast is all about inspiring families to read together, uh, whether it's on the couch with their babies or, you know, in the car going to, to school, talking uh, about a wonderful book like Beverly right here, um, re co-reading it. And, and so what kind of conversations do you think families can have uh, after a while experiencing Beverly right here? 
Um, well, I would love to be a fly on the wall mm. as families read together. And I don't know. It's it, one. Let me just say this. I'm so thrilled to think that a family would sit down and read this book together. A lot of what happens when kids learn to read themselves, parents will say, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, that's then they don't read to them anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I go out and do um, signings, I hear so much from families who come through the line that they read together. The kids are like 12, 13, 14, and they still, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, it's our favorite time of the day. Mm -hmm. It's like, we'll, we'll do that before we go to bed. We'll do it after dinner. And it's just, it's such a great way to, um, we put down our defenses mm-hmm. uh, when somebody's reading a story to us and, and you connect in ways that you don't really, you're not even really aware of doing. I was in the Atlanta airport, um, a couple nights ago, really late at night and I was super tired and I was walking through the terminal and I saw this dad reading to his four kids and I was so moved by it you know there they were in all the middle of all this hubbub and the kids were totally totally listening okay so anyway uh what would what would they talk about in Beverly they would talk about um I think it's so right there on the surface about love and and who to trust and how to see people and how to let yourself be seen. I hope that those would be the conversations, but um, I bet you there would be even different conversations depending on who the readers are and what their experience has been in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an important one for families to have, how, who to trust and how we can kind of figure that out. Right. Based on how that person moves through the world, you know, um, there are some unsavory characters in this book and, um, Beverly is literally nobody's fool and she sees them for who they are almost immediately and then, and doesn't have, you know, is not going to be hoodwinked by them. But there are other, uh, broken characters, um, who are not dangerous. Um, they're beautiful, loving people who are imperfect and those she knows it's okay. I, I, I love meeting characters who, are, as you said, they're broken, but they're loving because I think it's, it's, I, I, I think it's really important because a lot of us are broken and we're all imperfect. And, and I think that prevents a lot of us from loving ourselves. And, but when we can kind of fall in love with those kind of characters in a book, I think it kind of helps us uh, be a, be a little easier on ourselves. And, and oh, I think so too. And 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 it's the it's that's the the beauty of you know they they've done all the the scientific experience experiments about uh, literature and how reading it can um, teach you to empathize. Mm-hmm. And so that's not only it's exactly what you're saying. It's not only with other people, but uh, a certain empathy for yourself um, and and to be more forgiving of yourself and to see yourself as um, imperfect, of course, broken, of course, but um, lovable. It's interesting with reading your bio um, that part of your inspiration for writing your first book, uh, because of when Dixie ha- w- was – that you were homesick for Florida. You moved from Florida to, to Minnesota, and, and that kind of inspired that, that book to come to life. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and where you get inspiration for, for your other works? Sure. So um, I moved here to Minnesota when I was 30, and I wrote Because of Winn-Dixie during my second winter here, which at that point was – at that point, was one of the worst winters on on record, and it was um, it, it was my first attempt. At, I had been writing uh, for a while, but it was mostly short stories for adults, and this is the first time I had tried a novel for kids. And so I had that. I didn't sit down thinking, "Oh, I'm going to write myself back home," but I was very homesick, and I sat down with the one line in my head: "I have a dog named Win Dixie," and. Um, 
and it was also a time in my life where I I didn't have a dog. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of wrote what my heart wanted, which was um, to go home and uh, the best dog that I could imagine. And and when I say I wrote what my heart wanted, I guess, you know, that's what I keep on. <laughs> mm-hmm. I keep on doing. And mm-hmm. that's where so much of the inspiration comes from is from uh, from writing um, what my heart needs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. You know, one of the th- things I'm touched, you know, you, you're talking about, about Beverly and, and what an interesting and strong and really dynamic character she is. How do you think female characters have changed over the years? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think that, um, I, I think that there's this wonderful, like empowerment that has happened in fiction uh, uh, for kids in general, but also um, with girls and and girls really coming into their own and stories. And that this is one of the things that I love about Beverly is how strong she is, how mm-hmm. fearless she is, mm-hmm. utterly fearless. And um, I am not. <laughs> and so and and again, you're writing, you know, what your heart desires. It's it's wonderful to be with a character who it, because she's um, she does not suffer fools, but she also never hesitates to step in when something is wrong. She stands up for people. Mm-hmm. And I love that about her. I Boy, oh, boy, I, I love that, too. And I've, I've mentioned many times on the show, I've, I do educational magic shows, and the, the theme that, that so many schools want me to talk about it, it, through my magic is uh, bullying. And, you know, they come up with all these different um, programs to, you know, teach kids not to bully and, and, and all of that. But, the, the, you know, the one thing that I found is that the, the most effective way to deal with bullying or inclusion is just inspiring kids to stand up, to stand up for each other and to, and to not tolerate folks being misused. Yeah, and I rem- it's it, that's that's it, all of it right there. I remember the school bus, uh-huh. um, which is like you know the breeding ground for uh, so much stuff. And I remember being I was probably in junior high, and I got on the bus, and um, uh, the uh, a friend of my family, this beautiful, she was in first grade. Um, and she was sitting on the bus and, um, this, a kid came on that everybody was saying, oh, you can't sit here. You can't sit here. You can't sit here. This beautiful little first grader said to this, you know, 10 year old boy, you can sit here and moved over and let him sit with her. And I thought even at that young age, me, I was able to see that's the way through right there mm-hmm. is just to like stand up and say, yeah, no, you can sit here. Mm-hmm. And she was only in first grade. And, um, and it's like, how do we teach ourselves to do that? And how do we teach other people to do it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. One of the things that you talked about is you, you write what your heart desires. This is a little bit different than a lot of the writing advice that you hear that, that, you know, that, that folks should write what they know, or write what they've lived. Um, what other kind of advice do you have to authors? Cause we do have a lot of authors who listen to the show. Um, I, I say, you know, cause a lot of times when I'm talking to kids, they, they, they're working on a book and they want to know advice. And it's like my advice that, so they'll say, what's your advice for kid writers? And it's like my advice whether you're a kid or whether you're 72 and you think you want to write a novel is the same. Um, and it's, it's relatively simple. So read as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And, um, you have to find some way to write. And this is like kind of a no brainer, but a lot of people, I was one of them. You dream of wanting to do it, but you don't actually sit down and do it because you're afraid that you might not be able to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you read, you write. For me, it's two pages a day. And then uh, the third thing is rewrite. Because no matter who you are, how talented you are, or how much you want to do this, it's not going to come out right the first time. Mm-hmm. So you, you have to rewrite it. And then uh, the fourth thing I say is keep a notebook. And uh, for me, the notebook is, is a reminder to pay attention 
um, to everything. I feel like everything is my business. Um, and so I'm always staring. I'm always listening. And the notebook is also a reminder to keep everything open, my eyes and my ears and my heart and my head. And I always have it with me. Yeah, that's so – I mean, you know, life is – happening all around us and I, I guess a big part of writing is just kind of reporting on that right and also you know it, a lot of times kids will say are you are you worried you're going to run out of story ideas and i'm like have, have you been on a city bus recently <laughs> like get on any method of public conveyance listen to people look at them not enough time and, the, and for all the stories that are out there you know oh, oh. Absolutely. But my wife uh, just had her first experience. We've been living in this particular neighborhood now for 20 years. And uh, it, it's it's a beautiful neighborhood, but there's there's a bus that kind of runs. And it was her first time on this particular bus. And she came home and she said, I will never get that <laughs> I am she back on there or she wants to write a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, it, it, it would be, it, I'd be, I, I, I think some of the listeners would yell at me, especially the authors would yell at me if I didn't ask you, what does it feel like you write because of Wins Dixie? It becomes a, 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 a bestseller, becomes a, a, a fantastic movie. What is that like? Well, um, it's still, it sounds disingenuous to say it, but it's, it still sounds unbelievable. It's, it's still unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It's like I, because I, when, uh, when I moved to Minneapolis, I got a job in a book warehouse, um, that, uh, was a book distributor for the whole upper Midwest here. And so I working there got a very good idea of what to expect, um, uh, sales wise for a first novel. Um, and so I, I went into it with, you know, like hoping that maybe 5,000 copies mm-hmm. of because of when Dixie would sell. And then that would be enough, uh, for me to like earn out my advance and, and write another book. And so that was my big dream. And, um, so what's happened is unbelievable uh that they were almost at the 20th anniversary because of when dixie and because of that they put numbers together and they told me this about a month ago that it's been 11 million copies wow. of because of when dixie yeah <laughs> so <laughs> what's it like it's 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 unbelievable and you know I, I i remember saying to my best friend a long time ago i don't deserve any of this and she said of course you don't. It's just great. It's just grace. And so I've like, I try to remember that, you know, that it's not, it's just, and to be grateful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Where can folks connect with, with Kate DeMello online? Um, I have a website, um, uh, which is katedemello.com. And uh, I also post on, Facebook, uh, the official Kate Camella page. Um, I, and I'm usually on there twice a week. Awesome. We've had such a great time speaking to the author of the brand new novel, Beverly, right here, Kate D. Camello. Kate, thank you so much for being part of our show. Oh, it was super fun. Thank you. Stay warm there. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be James Twyman. This is going to be a slightly different show. We're not going to be talking about a great book that we can read together as a family. We're going to be talking about a great theatrical experience, a very unique theatrical experience we may be able to to experience as a family. The, the, The show is called Brother, Son, Sister Moon by James Twyman. And, and he will be in this. Is the show is is based on the life of Saint Francis Assisi. I think it's a perfect, perfect conversation for the holiday season. So that's the next episode of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, you may have been surprised to discover that once your book was published, you became the uh, head of marketing for that book. You became really the person that was most responsible for getting out there and letting folks know about the book. I mean, hey, look, we just had Kate D. Camello come on the show. She sold over 11 million copies, and she's still out there promoting and helping to market 
her brand new book, Beverly, right here. Well, Kate's getting some help. She sold over 11 million books. Folks want to help her sell another 11 million books. You probably haven't sold 11 million books yet, but you don't have to do it alone. We would love to help you. We have a wonderful program. It's called the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program. We have a panel of uh, teachers, parents, and kids. And if they believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read. And with that status comes a whole lot of tools that will help your book stand out from amongst the crowd of books that are published every single month. Check it out today. Go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author services button at the top of the page to find out all about it. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Kate D. Camello. Be sure to check out Beverly right here. I want to thank our sponsors, Holly Kinley. Check out Pilates for Parenting, a fantastic resource for all parents and caregivers. We also want to thank our friend Sarah Ann Kinnear. Be sure to check out her great series, Little Pearl's Reflection. I want to thank my producer, Fatima Khan, for all she does for the podcast. Be sure to check out her blog at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank you. Thank you so much, my beautiful listeners, for being here today. Thank you so much for spreading the word about the show to your family and friends. Now, And now if you have the time, thanks in advance for leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. And, of course, most of all, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. <laughs>